used in the MGM inventory. But that was not the whole truth. Soon, what was common knowledge among Hollywood costumers became obvious to Roberta Bauman, David Weiss, and not insignificantly, the man who paid $15,000 at the MGM auction for what he thought were the only ruby slippers. After the sale, Debbie Reynolds quietly told people she didn't bid on the shoes because she believed they belonged to Judy Garland's stand-in. I tried them on, and I would have bid, but I knew they weren't the real pair, so why would I bid? What Reynolds didn't say was that she knew there were other pairs of ruby slippers, and she knew who had them. His name was Kent Warner, and he alone held the secret of the missing ruby slippers. Treasure will continue in a moment here on A&E. We now return to Treasure here on A&E. After the MGM auction and Roberta Bauman's revelation, the mystery of the ruby slippers began to grow. People began to wonder how many pairs actually existed. Only one man ever knew. His name was Kent Warner. He was a Hollywood costumer who was very bright and talented with a keen understanding of movie history. Like Debbie Reynolds, Kent Warner witnessed the wholesale trashing of Hollywood's most important costumes and props during the 1960s and 70s. He watched the big studios throw everything away, and he did something about it. His friends called him Lana Lip, but he became better known as Hollywood's Robin Hood. Because of his clandestine actions, many Hollywood treasures were saved from destruction. Kent Warner came to Hollywood when he was 21 years old. He was a native of New York who loved movies and wanted to work in show business. His first job was with a Hollywood rental company that specialized in movie wardrobe. It was 1964. That summer, the rental house bought the RKO wardrobe collection. RKO, once home to Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, had been thoroughly trashed by various owners since the 1950s. By 64, its physical assets were in disarray. Warner was sent to RKO by his boss to see what was there. He was shocked. Some costumes were being used as kitchen rags. Others were rotting on their hangers. Beautiful garments, once worn by Hollywood's greatest stars, were falling apart. The rental house was only interested in wearable items. Throw away the rest, Warner was told. The tragic scene made Kent wonder, how could so much history, so many beautiful things, be treated so badly? Very quickly, he sized up the situation. The studios, all of them, were systematically trashing important Hollywood artifacts. He saw it being trashed. I saw it being trashed. I would drive every night off the lot, and they were burning film clips over in trash cans. They threw all the original music, all the scores, over the, when they were building the freeway. It's buried under the freeway. Kent Warner agonized about this. Things had to be saved, rescued, liberated. So instead of throwing away Ginger Rogers' famous gowns, he kept them for himself. But Kent Warner took his work one step further. Some clothes, like top hats, were reusable. But Warner didn't turn in the ones marked with the name Fred Astaire. And nobody missed them. Kent Warner understood the value of historic costumes. They were treasures worth good money. One thing led to another, and soon Kent Warner was quietly selling wardrobe out of the trunk of his car. It was risky, but lucrative and rewarding. Almost single-handedly, he created a thriving underground marketplace for historic Hollywood memorabilia. Between 1964 and 1972, Kent Warner worked this Robin Hood act at all the major studios. Because he was a costumer by trade, he regularly went to all the studio wardrobe departments and rental houses in town. He got to know all the people, even the gate guards. He could drive his car anywhere on any lot. 
and carry off an armful or rack of costumes. He had carte blanche. He also had a connoisseur's eye. Warner recognized the important pieces and went for them. He sought out clothes worn by Rudolph Valentino, Marilyn Monroe, Clark Gable, Greta Garbo, and not just run-of-the-mill items, but key pieces, like Bogart's trench coats from Casablanca. He went for the best. Certain costumes had personal value to him, especially those worn by Judy Garland. Kent Warner idolized Judy Garland. In 1965, he attended the Academy Awards, and during the dinner, he mugged behind the Hollywood siren. More than anything, Kent Warner hoped that one day he might be able to find and rescue Judy Garland's ruby slippers. The day came in 1970 when Kent Warner hired on at MGM to help prepare the costume inventory for auction and liquidation. He worked there. He worked for free. They gave him costumes instead of money. They paid him a little bit of money and they let him pick what he wanted. He was just smart enough to work there. I would have worked there for free. Kent Warner became the genius behind the scenes at the MGM auction. He was more knowledgeable than anyone else, and he was driven in part by his desire to find and save the ruby slippers. Treasure will continue in a moment here on A&E. We now return to Treasure here on A&E. In the spring of 1970, Kent Warner quietly searched every inch of MGM for the ruby slippers. He had no idea what he might find. Finally, he came to a decrepit building where thousands of old costumes were stored. Somewhat precariously, he climbed into the loft. It was hot, smelly, and dark, he later told friends. Then a ray of sunlight picked up the glimmer of a sequin. I walked over. I didn't touch them. I blew the dust from them. The red and the sequins appeared, and I knew they were the ruby slippers. Warner found all of them, he thought, including the Arabian test fair. It was the most exciting moment of his life. But what he did next was most intriguing. Rather than hand them over to the auction, he took them home. One by one, he studied each pair, each shoe, examining them carefully, looking at the numbers stamped on the creamy kid leather lining. He looked at the writing in each, and he determined which were which, which were used for the dance numbers, which used in medium and long shots, which were used for the close-ups, which were used by the stand-in. This mattered to Kent Warner and to history. He also found something remarkable. Two pairs, one well-worn, the other in perfect condition, appeared to be cross-matched in size and stock numbers. In fact, the right shoe of one pair matched the left of the other, and vice versa. Because the shoes were slightly different in size, one 5C, the other 5BC, this discovery meant one of two things. One, that Judy Garland had one foot bigger than the other. But more likely, the pairs were mismatched in the sequining process. This was a classic example of how Hollywood worked, often haphazardly. Most important to Warner were the close-up or insert shoes, the take-me-home-to-Kansas shoes, the witches' shoes. These he would keep for himself. Altogether, the trove of ruby slippers were an incredible find. Only a couple of people knew Kent Warner had them, fellow costumers working the auction, but even they were not privy to the details. The ruby slippers were his secret, his delicious secret. Kent Warner enjoyed letting people assume what they wanted to assume. When he delivered a pair of size 5C ruby slippers to MGM's liquidators, he said, look what I found, the ruby slippers, nothing more. He let the auctioneer and everyone else assume they were the one and only pair. What's more, they were the runts of the litter, 
in terrible shape, definitely well-worn by someone, either Judy Garland, her stand-in, or both. When they sold for $15,000, Kent Warner was thrilled. His effort to save these historic treasures was ratified. Then came news of a pair of ruby slippers in Memphis, Tennessee. Roberta Bauman, size 6B ruby slippers. Kent Warner had to laugh. He was the only person in the world who knew the whole truth of the ruby slippers. He knew how many pairs existed, and he personally owned the best. Kent Warner reveled in his secret and the power he suddenly possessed. When he told people he planned to sell some of the slippers, the genius of the MGM auction became everyone's best friend. Warner always hoped the costumes he saved from destruction would be preserved by people who cherished Hollywood history. People like Debbie Reynolds, 